we have three presenters. So what the PS Plus requirements are for your pigments are listed here. Please know that it's based on stories. And so if you're a five plus story building, it's less than 0 0.08 CFM and 50 pascals. Um, it's a little bit more stringent than a smaller building. And so today we're just going to focus on the air tightness aspect of passive house here on the bottom right. I put in just some comparisons like what the Chicago code requires and what Ashbury requires. And what's interesting is that Ashbury 9.1.13, which is optional to follow as one of the energy code in Chicago, does require a continuous air barrier, but there are different meanings to what that air barrier could be. It doesn't have to be And then the Army Corps of Engineers is probably the most stringent, other than passive house, on in terms of air things. So we're we're pushing the envelope literally here, but um, what we can see on this slide is that it's achievable. This is the Cornell Tech building that just completed construction in, in New York. It is meeting the air tightness requirement. It's, I hear that it's a super airtight building, both on the envelope and on the mechanical duct side. It's about, it's over 20 stories. It's going to be the world's largest and tallest, maybe not the tallest. So that's awesome. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark, and he's going to talk about the on-site and off-site questions. Any questions so far? <clears throat> I like what uh, John said at the beginning about this being a very casual, informal environment. I really like you guys' addition to the understanding of it's, it's a good thing. Anyway, if you have questions at all as we go, just I don't ask this. It's not very easy to handle that way. Um, a colleague of mine did a presentation recently at AIA uh, on a very kind of similar topic in a way. So I kind of feel I have to apologize. You might, those of you, if any of you were in attendance at that, you might find some similar content here. Um, Tim was in attendance and asked us if we would present today. Obviously, we accepted, so here we are. We have tried to sort of focus today, refocus the presentation on. Air barrier, air tightness, and some of the measures you can take to um, hopefully achieve air tightness in your construction. So, we'll this a few nuggets, new nuggets here for people who are also at the AIA. So, uh, my name is Mark Van Dalen uh, with UL CLED. And uh, in terms of an agenda, um, I don't know if we're going to do a bit of shameless marketing off the bat, but tell a little bit of what the UL CLED is all about. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking uh, very quickly about what an air barrier is, why it's so important, and then just how you go about integrating it into a design. Um, Tim asked if we have a bit of time talking about uh, one particular type of wall assembly that uh, consistently achieves very high performance for air tightness. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the measures that you can take for construction to hopefully end up with a, a good airtight build. Uh, that includes laboratory testing, uh, field testing. And I mean field testing of the actual specimen, and then also a third imaging uh, to detect any problems. Um, we've already got ourselves a bit out of sync here because uh, I thought Tim was going to be talking at the end about passive house requirements. He's already done it, so uh, ignore that last one. So uh, UL Club, hopefully you all, uh, you all know UL uh, already as uh, being a, an organization that has for decades been uh, spending time uh, researching and doing testing, so as to their, their focus has been to make our buildings safer from a life safety perspective. Um, we are the division of UL that does the same thing, hopefully, uh, with the focus on the building envelope. So, uh, testing and advisory services that hopefully end up with better performing building envelope assemblies. We have uh, two large uh, full scale testing facilities one in Northbrook uh, and one in Montreal. Uh, and then we have in the other office locations, we have uh, staff that just get involved in the advisory side of the services where we do most of the more consulting. Clients like architects about envelope issues or building owners who have problems with their, their building envelope as well. They construct. So, as they say, uh, I call it Chicago, it's in Black North Park. It's a 63,000 square foot facility out there where we do full scale mock up testing. If any of you ever want to go up and see it for a tour or anything, we're more than happy to, to receive you and uh, let you come and have a look at what the tests. Uh, if any given day, you may see something different, depends what's going to go through at the time, but uh, you're more than welcome. 
You also do up in Montreal if you want to pump that way, but uh, here I have a little bit further afield. Uh, Montreal is a little bit smaller um, in terms of total testing. You'll notice uh, in the Chicago one, that it, it's the building and all of, all the testing is done in-house of the inside in Chicago, which is very nice when you have a cold climate to, to deal with at certain times of the year. Uh, in Montreal, we have the indoor facility as well, but a large number of our chambers are actually at the door. Uh, causes a little, little bit of green. It's uh, very, very cold. Water freezes before it goes through the walls. <laughs> anyway, that's about us. Um, you all know, I'm sure, what the uh, building hold is. So I just put this one slide in here. It's the physical separation between the conditioned indoor space and the unconditioned environment. And it's got to hopefully resist the transfer of a lot of different things, including air, water, heat, light, fire, noise. Uh, so this is just a little schematic we have just to kind of illustrate that as, as a, a fundamental requirement or objective of the envelope. And this slide just shows you uh, the same schematic, but it also shows you in the table the list of all the things that are really required in the and the list is quite long. Uh, you know, structural, it's got to carry the loads that are imposed upon it. Uh, heat flow, airflow, moisture flow, and moisture both in liquid form, so that would be rainfall and snowfall and sort of precipitation, but also in vapor form. So more and more these days, we want to make our buildings comfortable in the winter times. So we put the air, sort of water into the air. Uh, well, that's a load that the envelope has to, to sustain in some manner. Um, solar radiation, sound transmission, uh, Fire durability, more and more there's a focus now on making sure our construction is durable. Uh, but it's also got to be um, secure. Uh, unfortunately, there are risks in the world today that we have to worry about. Uh, economy, uh, the budgets aren't always there for building the top notch, so uh, we have to be conscious of uh, the cost, both in terms of building in the first place and what it's going to take to run the thing. And then there's the environmental impacts, uh, build buildability, and, and of course aesthetics. And the little schematic at the bottom left is just there to remind me and tell you that it's often a balancing act. Uh, so when the budget comes out for a building or a certain build for the envelope, like any other systems, you can't necessarily hit the top uh, end of the spectrum on all of these aspects of performance. And so depending on the use of the occupancy and the design service life, you sometimes end up balancing between some of these various requirements, making sure that you end up with something that, that will give the client what they need for the duration of the time they hope to use the building at a reasonable cost. But today we're just going to be talking about air tightness and air barriers just because it's the, the thing that Tim thought was the most topical and most appropriate for this group. Um, so the first thing that I just wanted to highlight for you is what is an air barrier and why we talk about the air barrier as distinct from the vapor barrier. The reality is that probably prior to 1985, I'm not aware of any code that said very much about building all the things. It did say anything, but probably only have been about some insulation to keep us warm and a vapor. And the reason behind that is that when problems first started to show up with building envelope, then there were moisture problems. The research, the researcher has decided at that point that the problem was the diffusion of moisture from inside the space. And so any material that we put uh, in the exterior wall will have some characteristic in terms of vapor permeability. And it means it's the rate at which vapor in the air can move through those materials uh, from higher vapor pressure to lower vapor. So in the winter time, pretty much all of our homes and all of our buildings have a high vapor pressure inside, and that means that the vapor will slowly diffuse through the materials to the outside. Uh, ironically, in warmer climates that we are now getting to deal with really well, uh, the problem is the reverse. In a lot of the warm tropical climates, um, the moisture load is, is the reverse because it's a higher vapor pressure outdoors, and the problem is the vapor getting into the building and having a real problem controlling the comfort levels inside. But for climates like Chicago, it's pretty much always the other way around. And so from a diffusion point of view, they said, well, you know, we really better start putting a vapor barrier in there, and it's a material that's going to be impermeable or close to impermeable vapor, it'll cut down the problem. And so that's where they started with the most codes. And the problem was that after a period of time, they realized that the moisture problems didn't really go away. And so they sort of scratched their heads and said, well, how can this be? We thought we had it licked. And they did further research, and upon further research, they realized that um, the vapor diffusion mechanism exists and it's real, but it's not nearly as significant in terms of how much moisture can move as air leakage. And so this little slide shows you that on the right hand side, uh, if you're dealing with diffusion, it's the amount of moisture you can move is a direct function of both the characteristics of materials, so how impermeable they are to moisture, 
but also the area. And so if I have a three meter by three meter square section of wall uh, with a few coats of paint on it, um, and I did this for a calculation for a cold winter climate, in one heating season, by diffusion, you're going to move a, about a third of a meter of water through that section of wall. And even if you had a little opening or a little discontinuity in that bigger barrier, because the area of that would be very small, it would make hardly any difference. There'd be almost no change in how much moisture can move through it. In contrast, if you take the same one meter or three foot by three foot wall area, and you put a one inch hole in it, one inch square hole in it, and now you take a pressure differential, and a pre pressure differential can be created by a mechanical system, it's a big building, or it could be created by stack effect if it was a tall, tall building, or it could just be wind effects. So any pressure differential, and I did this calculation just for a 10 Pascal per differential, which is really, really low. But through that one inch by one inch hole, at 10 Pascals over the same winter time, you get about 30 liters of water. And it's because the moisture is being transported in the airflow, and the mass transport of that water ends up being far more water that was going out through a hole than you'd ever get by diffusion. And so they realized that, gosh, if that's the case, we've got to stop that airflow. And hence the reason that we're here. So we now have, in a lot of codes, a requirement for a vapor retarder or vapor barrier, as well as an air barrier. The difference being that if you have a small discontinuity or a small opening or something in your vapor barrier, no big deal. But in an air barrier, it's going to be a big deal on a cold climate. So you have to absolutely get continued continuity in the air barrier system. It's got to be something, something that's impervious to the air and that can stand the, the pressures of the wind so the air doesn't flow, and it's got to be continuous. And this little slide is just a schematic. It's a, uh, a vertical cut through a very common residential wall assembly. Brick exterior, airspace, a frame stud wall with insulation in the framing. And then schematically we show on the inside that there is both a vapor barrier and an air barrier. And what we're depicting here is a break in that air barrier, which is an unsealed electrical element. So the fact that that would be a break in the vapor barrier would really be of uh, no, no consequence. But what happens is if that exists and we are continuously flowing the uh, moist air through those gaps, it'll come back and it'll eventually contact a cold surface, which might be the exterior sheathing of the frame to wall, or it might be the inside face of that masonry, and it'll drop that moisture. And it'll drop it in liquid form if it's cool, or it'll drop it if it's frost or ice if it's cold. So climate like we're in here, the last few days, it's going to drop it as ice, and then when it warms up a little bit, it turns back to water, and lo and behold, there's a source that causes all the degradation. So Passive House has an element, if you look at the documentation, has an element or a bit of discussion about the concern of air leakage as it relates to moisture deposition in your wall and why you want to prevent it. But they also, and I would argue maybe more so, concern themselves with the fact that we've paid money to condition that in your air. You know, we, we've paid money to, to raise the temperature and to put humidity into it. And therefore, as the air and the moisture flow, money is flowing as well. So from an energy efficiency and from a cost perspective, the air barrier problem is not just a moisture problem, but it's, it's a real dollar problem as well. This is just a, sh a shot that I took that I think is really a good illustration of the problem. This is a metal glass curtain wall. As you can see, it's the bottom of a, of a wall system. There's a, a ground floor or sort of overhang or setback. Of it. And this is after a prolonged period of cold weather. There had been no rain. There had been no snow that could have melted. And yet there are icicles hanging out the bottom of this wall. So that, those icicles are the direct result of air leakage. Water that was in the air on the inside was blown through the assembly wherever the holes existed, condensed on the cold metal surfaces, and formed at the, at the edge of the building like this. And I was smiling as I was walking here today, because as you walk along the sidewalk, just a few blocks from here, there are signs saying, beware of icicles. So this is a real problem, because if these things are growing and then falling on you and I walking along the street, building owners have a problem on hands. So it's not just durability that's at, at, at risk here. So I guess the question is, well, how does, how does this air barrier concept get integrated into the design? And it really isn't rocket science. Um, when a designer is, is planning their work and thinking through their details and whatnot, they simply have to have it in their head that there is another element to the overall assembly that they have to incorporate throughout the entire design. And that's an element, as I say, 
It's got to be continuous, it's got to be impervious to air, and it's got to be able to carry the load of the wind. So during the early concept of the development stage, what often happens, and this is just a, a couple of sketches that, that are examples of it, but you often have a selection made of the kind of materials, the kind of systems you choose to use, uh, sort of the massing and the, and the general layout. And the idea is that you need to be sitting down at that point once you've got those basic premises laid out and making sure that you've incorporated something that joins them all together. And it doesn't matter what kind of material you're going to be using per se, as long as it meets the characteristics that are laid out, but you need to be able to see that there is continuity of panels to uh, windows to doors to all of the different ones you've chosen. And so this is a, uh, the type of thing that often happens where you know, the architect will sit down with the, the, uh, the colored the, the, the color pencils and whatnot, and they'll actually sketch out in, in different layers, different colors, to make sure that they can visualize uh, where all the, uh, the air barrier elements are going to be and what they're going to be. And sometimes it's not just one. <clears throat> this is an example where uh, this is the mullion for a glazing system. This is a structural steel element, and this is going to be the part of the air seal joining the two. <coughs> so the air barrier here is in fact a combination of the aluminum framing, the membrane, whatever they use to join the, the uh, aluminum framing to the steel element. So it could be a whole uh, combination of materials. Once that concept's developed, and I don't expect you to be able to see this very well, but once the concept is developed, um, that of course has to be translated in some manner into the working drawings. Because at the end of the day, the working drawings are going to go to the GCs and to the trades. That's what they're going to follow that, to, to build the thing. So this is a vertical section cut through uh, the, the um, exterior wall where the middle of the floor projects out past the floor above and below. So we end up with a terrace here and a soffit here. And I could have chosen any drawing, but what you need to be able to do is when you look at this drawing, you need to make sure that the concept you developed at the beginning of a is followed through appropriately, so that every one of these details uh, has an element in it that is airtight and, and can show continuity. And I often say to people, if you can take a red pen and you can draw one line with your red pen from the beginning to the bottom, and it never stops anywhere, you've got continuity. But if you can't draw it because there's some gap of some sort, of a, you, you run out of material that's impervious, for example, you've got a problem. So you've got to have a continuous red line. And it doesn't matter whether it's this profile or a roof wall junction or uh, I know, a much simpler, straightforward, just planar wall. It's always the same idea. There needs to be something in there that uh, you, you can look at to see this connection between all the different components. So there, are, of course, are a myriad of wall systems that designers can choose when they go to do commercial wall construction. For that matter, residential as well. Uh, masonry systems, precast systems, uh, eave systems, um, individual windows. But Tim asked me to just have a, a few moments to talk about the system that seems time and time again to give us the very best performance if we talk about commercial wall assemblies, and it's unitized metal gas curtain wall. Um, and I'm talking here about air tanks performance. It also has good performance in other areas as well. But in terms of air tanks, it, it's the one assembly that is probably easiest for the architect and for the builder to know that they're going to reliably get good performance at the end. And there's a pretty good reason for it. So if you know about the unitized curtain wall system, uh, and jargon changes from location to location, but it's basically made up of either a bunch of different units, or you call them modules, or you call them panels, or whatever you want to call them. But these individual panels, modules, units are pre-assembled and pre-fabricated off-site in a factory. And they're then brought to the site on a truck, they're hoisted up, and they're assembled together, kind of like Lego blocks in a way, and when they're all put together, you've got your exterior wall. <laughs> really, really attractive because, uh, well, for a number of reasons, but number one, they don't take any space on site. They can be under construction, under fabrication while you're doing the structure, so there's no scheduling issues there. Uh, and it means your building can be closed extremely quickly because as fast as you can put the panels together on the, on the wall, you're closed in, as opposed to bringing the individual components to the site but they're very attractive from many points of view. So here's a, just a schematic, and, and the modules take all kinds of different shapes and all different forms. They, they have all kinds of different materials in them, but the basic premise is the same. You decide on what the module overall size is going to be, and typically they're constructed on horizontal tables. So there's a, a line of flat tables in the front. And the framing around the perimeter of the module, they're all open. 
by that I mean they're, they're basically a half section because they're going to snap together with the, the making half of the adjacent panel and they put together on the wall. So perimeter frames are, are all put together. Any internal intermediate frames are solid sections. They're also laid out. And these things are all assembled on the flat and screwed together. And most importantly for today's discussion, all the seams are sealed, all the screw heads are sealed, all the framing is, is sealed together so that you can be confident that there's no leakage paths. Yeah. Yes? The material of, of, of truffles is what? For the framing? Yeah. Virtually all panel system for metal and glass is done in aluminum. There are panelized systems now coming out that have, uh, well, for example, these have been panelized for some period of time, and people are now doing it even with uh, steel stud framing with uh, either ACM panels or aluminum plate panels. But, but this, the, the most common unified system is, is aluminum framing. And then in the openings, which is where it's going next, so you, you, have, you have defined the openings with the aluminum framing. And then inside the openings, you glaze in a panel of some description. So it could be a fission unit, an insulated glass unit, or it could be a uh, insulated back pan. And over the face of that, you might put metal, you might put thin veneer of stone, you might, might put more glass. Um, but the point is that whatever you're putting in, as in terms of the panel, is also sealed in the factory to what has already been sealed as a framing element. So all those critical seals that are import so important to us from an air tanker perspective, they're all done in what is presumably good quality control inside the factory without any fighting against Mother Nature and the weather. And you're not dangling on a swing stage, you're on some rigging scaffold, you're, you're solid feet on the ground inside of the so the, this element comes off the line as a very, very robust element from their air barrier point of view. And when they get to the site, basically they're installed in horizontal bands or rows around the building, and then you sequentially put row upon row as you go up. So here we've got one row in position and the first panel on the higher row installed, and what we're showing is the next panel is going to come along. It's going to snap together and interlock with the making half of, on the vertical edge of the panel that's already installed. And once that's interlocked, it's going to be dropped down horizontally, sorry, vertically, to in, engage and interlock with the top of the panel below. Now, all of these joints between panels have uh, well-designed rubber gaskets in them. And so when panels stack together, or stack on top of each other, it's not a lot different than when you close your car door. And there's a very effective seal. I don't know if anybody's ever had water leakage through their car doors. Probably not very often. There. But there's a very effective seal. When, when you uh, close the car door, you compress the seal. It's not a lot different with these systems. When you snap the, the making halves together, you compress a very good rubber gasket in there, which is a very good job of sealing. And when you drop the panel down, it sits over top of the gasket, which is also now compressed by the load of the panel. So you also have a, a very good seal. So you've got a very nice system now because within panel, all the critical joint seams, screw heads, everything else, panels, panels, boom, that was all sealed in the factory. And on the site, all the, the primary joints between panels are sealed in a pretty reliable manner with the, the gasketing. And what you're left with is the lone pinch point is the four-way intersection. And that's because at that point, you've got vertical gasketing and horizontal gasketing that somehow has to join. And sadly, we don't have a completely uh, high-tech solution for that yet. It basically relies on, on caulking or sealant still. So this is, these two little schematics just show you the, the idea as to how that's achieved. Um, in, on the left-hand side here, uh, in this line here, you would have a, a gasket between the interlocking panels. So this is the top right corner of one panel, the top left corner of another panel, and down this line there would be a rubber gasket that's being compressed by the panels coming. So that rubber gasket is brought up and turned over, and it's basically sealed in, using a caulking material, sealed in here to, to cap off that top end of the panel. And once that's done, they would typically bed a closure piece over that whole joint so as to reinforce the seal to make sure we have uh, some belt and braces on the air seal, but also to make sure that from a water point of view, we're going to be able to deflect water back out of that joint. And the finished product would look something like this. With in reality, most fabricators these days cover all of this up with a metal flashing as well. 
because it gives you a nice clean line with every panel job. So what does it look like in reality? Here's a, a construction of your way. So here's the panel that's, that's coming up to the floor uh, with the crane. You can see the panels are coming along the installation this way. So it's brought up into position with the crane like this. It's uh, brought to, into alignment with the adjacent panel. So you can see they're here um, making the interlock between this panel and the one that's already been installed. And it's obviously not yet finished installation because you can see it hasn't yet been dropped down into position. And here is a, uh, the top side of one row completed. So all the panels on this, on this band are done. Um, if you look carefully, this is a gasket. This particular manufacturer supplies that gasket in 100 foot lengths. So when a row is finished, they literally unroll 100 feet of rubber gasket, put it on the, on the top. There are no seams except for every 100 feet. And that's what's going to ultimately be compressed when the panels, the next row, sits down on top of it. This is the metal that I told you is commonly installed over top of each row. And this is the very high tech uh, gob of sealant that is bleeding out from that, that four way intersection that I described. Um, here's another shot of, you know, of sort of in progress. This particular system, the gasketing, the horizontal gasketing, is installed in the factory on the panel. And so when you get to a joint, you, this blob of sealant. That's what's installed to, to achieve continuity of that gasket across the panel joint. And this panel is just about to come down. So everything is ready to receive it. it it's already interlocked on the vertical. It'll be dropped down and it'll sit. The bottom of this panel will sit on either the gasket here or on the sealant at the intersection and achieve continuity of the, the air barrier that way. And the gasket in the vertical will come down and sit over top. And that gasket, I don't know if you can see this or not, but Here's the horizontal rubber gasket that's already installed on top of the finished row. And this black line here, that's the, the gasket on the vertical edge of the panel. And if you look very carefully, it just comes over and basically the two gaskets overlap and, and pinch together. That's the only weak point, as it turns out, in the whole assembly. The only place where you might have some problem. Because if the, if the two gaskets, if one rolls a little bit, or if the two gaskets don't have enough compression on each other, just at that intersection is where you may have a bit of a problem. And so to overcome that, they do it. So here's seeing this in two different views of the same shot, but you can see that the two gaskets are, are overlapping and interlocked here. And this is the goop that goes in just to kind of seal it off and hopefully take care of anything that might exist. But that's pretty attractive because that means now with a single supplier, right, there's not multiple trades involved in this, we're a single supplier. What you're left with is in that entire wall face. And this, this could be 30, 40 stories of building. You know, the only areas that are left over as a risk to you from your fence point of view are those individual points of each intersection. Which, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, we can ignore it, but compared to the risk of having a discontinuity in field applied tapes or field applied caulking or whatever the case may be over the same wall area, it, it becomes a very, very attractive system. There's the, there's the group of so, uh, if you're looking for a system that's uh, uh, giving you the best possibility, the best chances of getting very, very airtight construction, you guys know that's what all certainly one thing to take some serious consideration. So, the next uh, couple things we want to talk about are the measures that you can take to hopefully end up with good construction, good airtight construction, regardless of what assembly you've chosen to use. And so, the first thing we want to talk about is laboratory analysis. And this slide detects sort of a whole range of things, or actually not all of them, but a range of things that we can test in the lab facility. And it in includes thermal characteristics, acoustic characteristics, water penetration performance, all those things that are on that list before. But we're here today to talk just about uh, air barriers. Here's a slide just to give you a, an idea of what these mock-ups look like. These are, are purposefully selected to include virtually all the details you're going to encounter on the site. So the idea is that when you look at the mock-up, you've tested everything that you're going to build. Now, it's not going to be exactly the same layout relative to each other, but you know, you'll, you'll have uh, corners, roof connections, uh, bottom connections, intermediate connections, so that you really mimic as many of the things that you're going to encounter when you build. Um, so the mock-ups are constructed. Uh, this is one underway, and I wanted to just do this to explain to you 
exactly uh, how tests are run. This white end wall, and this white back wall, and this wall, which is actually white on the other side of this, they're all steel plate, and that's our chamber. And so when the mock-up is uh, outlined to us, the size of the mock-up, we literally move the side walls depending on what width the mock-up is going to be. So there are you know, welders, and those walls are, are moved around as required. And similarly, when the height is decided, we move this ceiling up and down. So some of the mock-ups are single-story like this, some are two or three mock-ups, two or three stories high. So we move all that around. Basically, what we give is an opening in a box. So there's, there's two ends, there's a back, there's a top and a bottom, and then there's a, one, one side of the box that has an opening. And the contractor comes and builds his specimen in that, in that hole. This is almost finished, and you can see there's just got a few panels left to go here. But that's a single story mock-up, which is uh, pretty much ready for testing. So we're here to talk about air tightness. The ASTM test for air tightness is ASTM 283. And uh, on the left here is a schematic, which sort of repeats what I showed you in the other slide. Uh, our chamber consists of a ceiling, a back wall, a floor, of course, and the two end walls that you don't see in this section. Connected to that chamber, we have an air supply. We can either supply or exhaust from the chamber. And that's because we sometimes want to measure air infiltration, air coming in through the specimen, and sometimes air exfiltration, which is air going out through. So the supply fan, the blower fan, can do in or out. And in line with supply is a four meter. <clears throat> so we know how much air is going in or out of that chamber. So it's really fairly simple. We have a pressure measuring device across the, the wall of the chamber. We, we adjust the flow of air until the pressure measuring device tells us we're at 50 pascal or 75 pascal or whatever. And when we hit that and maintain it, we read the flow meter. It tells us how much air we're losing through the chamber while we're maintaining that pressure. So here's a mock-up. This one happens to be two stories, as you can see. And it's all ready to go for testing. And you're going to say, Mark, of course it's, it's, got, it's got plastic that can't be ready for testing. But the plastic has a, a fairly important function for us because and try as we might, and we do try our best, our chamber construction is not perfect. There's bound to be some leakage through the chamber. We call it extreme leakage. So before we actually test the specimen, we, we mask it. We sometimes hear it referred to as a tear or a mask, but we cover the entire face with one sheet of polyethylene film. And we then do a pretest, effectively, where we generate the pressure, we measure the flow, and we know there's no flow going through the specimen because it's got covered with a piece of plastic. Yes? What about the planning on each chamber? Is it the manufacturer or is it the No, no, we grow. It, it's always the contractor who's going to do the build because uh, you can imagine if somebody else builds it and it doesn't work, guess, guess whose who's fault it is, right? So we do all the work to provide the chamber and, and get everything ready for it. But when the chamber is ready, they come in with the materials and they um, and it's an interesting point because um, we're going to talk about field testing a little bit later on, but it's a, it's a good segue into it. Um, laboratory testing is of tremendous value in my opinion because uh, it lets the stakeholders know that the system that they've selected or the assembly that they've selected uh, will achieve the performance they want if it has been assembled in an appropriate manner. However, if you come to a lab, you look around, you'll notice fairly quickly that number one, often they're built indoors. So that's a little bit of a benefit for them. Um, there's very little pressure usually to build it. So a lock up like this might take a couple weeks, a week or a couple weeks to build, and they install it with their very best installers. Like the most senior guys from the, from the company show up they were And it's all in the interest of passing those tests. And it, it's valuable and it's valid because it does say that if you the right way it'll work. When you get to the field, all of a sudden you're not indoors, so you're fighting a potential inclement weather. There's often time pressure schedules, right? When people are pushing to get this thing done, they are usually behind and trying to catch up. And unfortunately, and no disrespect to the contractors here in the room, but unfortunately, uh, we don't necessarily have a full slate of highly experienced people working on it. If you've got 40 or 50 guys working on the site, some fraction of those are going to be. People who, you know, they're maybe not, uh, maybe it's the first time working on a football. Maybe it's early on in their career. They just have enough, maybe they just 
not as confident as some of the others. So um, they come and they build it here, but they come here with their very best crew, and it's one of the reasons why I think it's invaluable, but, but it doesn't replace field testing. And I often get calls from people saying, we've got a problem with our construction, we can't understand it because we had it tested in the lab. Well, that's great to have it tested in the lab, because if you don't know that it can work at all in the lab, then you're maybe fighting about the lab. But if you know it worked in the lab and it doesn't work in the field, chances are it's not the system problem, it's a workmanship or install problem. So, here's a, another shot of the, the, of the 283 test, and I just included, included so you understand. Uh, as I say, we often want to know an infiltration rate and an exfiltration rate. So in this shot, the, pulp, the mask film, you can see it's being drawn into the specimen. So this is us finding the extraneous reading for the infiltration condition. And the same specimen, uh, and here we're getting the extraneous reading for the exfiltration condition. So we get those extraneous readings, which is the leakage attributable to the uh, chamber. We then rip off the polyethylene do the same test again at the same pressure, get a different number often, and the difference between the two is what's attributable to the specimen. That's the key number that all the people in this room are going to be interested in. So that's ASTM 283, laboratory test, and it's quantitative. So it's determining an exact air leakage rate for comparison to a performance requirement in the standard OEM code. Uh, what often happens is that when you get a failure at a, a laboratory test, uh, I don't think anybody in this room can see air flowing unless there's something fluttering in it. So the uh, contractor normally is frustrated because he's just got a failure and he doesn't know where the, the problem is. So to be helpful to them, and it's not part of the ASTM 283 standard, but we, to be helpful to them, it's not uncommon that we will fill the chamber if you look through the glass and you can see it's kind of cloudy, we'll fill that chamber with an artificial, artificial uh, smoke or an artificial fog. And what that does is it blows that fog through the holes that cause the leakage problem, that cause the failure. And so, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a cloud of smoke or fog billowing out at the top of this upper of the unit here. And it's really helpful to the, the owner or to the uh, contractors because it homes in right away at where you need to focus on adjustments and modifications and having so, uh, once you've left the field, once you know now with confidence that the system can work, the next option that you can consider is field mock-up testing. So, in the field, uh, what we do is very, very similar, but uh, it's now reflective, hopefully, of both the system and the actual performance of the crews who have done it. And we would often try to do maybe more than one so you can randomly select different areas that have been done by different people on different days, but anyway, it, it's all about uh, checking out the, the, the workmanship of the guys doing the work on, on site. But the basic premise is the same. You, you pick an area that's going to be your specimen. Now, unlike the lab, where we build the chamber with a hole in it, and they put the specimen in, into it, we select the, the specimen this time, or the architect does, and we have to build the chamber to match the specimen. So, this is the shot of one of these temporary chambers we constructed on the inside. So it's a thin wall with a, we use a heavy vinyl so it's possible to see through it. But other than that, it's really the same test we ran. It's called 783, which is the sister field test of the 283 laboratory test. There's the blower equipment, so blower connected to it, an inline flow meter so we know how much air is flowing, and a pressure meter so we know we've got the right pressure to measure the flow. So really identical test to the lab we saw earlier. Uh, so 783, that we just finished talking about, it also is qualitative, sorry, quantitative, it gets you a number for comparison with the prescription of the standard. ASTM 1186 is qualitative only, and it's used where you're trying to do what they call air leakage site detection. So much like I said we do in the uh, laboratory when they get a failure and we use the fog to help people find out where, 1186 is site detection using a gas, but the tracer gas that we always use is just an artificial flaw. So here's, this is a, a new build, construction underway. This is another one of those chambers with the blower unit attached. And you can see through the, the clear, this is actually clear vinyl, you can see it's completely filled up with, with fog. And then this is a, just another couple of shots of 
another chamber filled with fog. There's the fog machine sitting inside the chamber, spitting forth. These units are, if you go to a concert, before you get there about 30 minutes or 40 minutes before the show starts, you'll see these units sitting inside the stage because they want to fill the air with fog so the light show is, is effective. It's exactly what the system is. It'll fill a, it'll, well, it'll fill an arena in about an hour. It'll fill something in about two minutes. Um, this is a handheld one that we have. Uh, we wouldn't use that to fill a chamber, but if we have done some of this work and somebody wants to kind of check out specific details, that's often another way that we can be a bit more focused on the specific where the fog is applied. And this is the kind of thing you see on the other side. So, metal glass curtain wall, for those of you who know it, you'll understand that it's absolutely essential that there is drainage through the, the, the uh, snap cap here for any exterior water that got in and around the glazing units. So, good, good thing to have drainage, but you absolutely should not see air that is inside the building. That's what this is. It's got fog flow, but that's air that's inside the building flowing in through those holes. So, a very, very clear indication that there's something going wrong here. And I really like the fog because if you get into a field situation with a contractor and you say, oh, your number is too high, now there's all kinds of other things about whether it is or isn't where it is. But when you put fog inside a building and you see that coming out, all the arguments stop. It's pretty clear. That's something that we use for ductwork too. So it's been really helpful for the project teams um, and with the, with the lower door testing as well. Um, so for the duct testing, we'll pressurize the duct and you don't have as cool of a system as your <laughs> one that fills up an arena. Um, but we've got a, a party size that, that we bring. Um, and it's been really effective as um, an educational tool um, to show the contractors where the leakage is actually coming from. Um, and then for the lower door testing, we'll bring single family and larger multi family um, to have either a, a small stick or something of that sort where we can see it, we can see it, it drives the point home. The fact that you can, you can see right. the air is the character. <laughs> it is smoke, no mirrors. So I think I've got a series of shots here just to give you some idea. Okay, so uh, this was a field test, um, and, and it failed numerically. The, the, the quantitative test failed, and again, the contractors now left with uh, where did where did the, the actual leakage problem happen? So that's what you see as, as the assembly when you start stripping things apart. But to the naked eye, can you tell where the problem was? Not that easy. But if you put the fog on it, you start to see where it's flowing from, to your point. Uh, when they can actually see the point where it's coming out, uh, there's, A, there's not much questions whether there's a problem or not, but it's much easier for them to figure out where they have to go to make the resolution. So here's another example. Uh, under construction, had some problems. Everybody is focusing on the electrical of it, right? For sure that's got to be where the problem is, for sure, for sure, for sure. And when you put the fog on it, lo and behold, where the membrane came across the bottom and had to do that connection with the side of the door, it was just a, a breach of some sort. It, you know, you could have taken an awful long time with the naked eye trying to find it, but it just kind of points it out just like that. Uh, similarly, a failure. Uh, this was probably not that surprising that it goes there, but that's an operable unit. An operable window unit, wall, so not that surprising, but again, so finally, I'm almost done here, but finally, infrared thermography. Uh, it's a very useful tool to be used. Uh, it has some limitations, but it's a, a very useful tool. Basically, thermography, for those who don't know, uh, these cameras are designed to sense energy on the surface they're scanning. They aren't x-rays, so they don't look inside. They can't tell you what's going on inside, what's causing it necessarily, but they can tell you that this area or this surface is a different energy or temperature level than this area. And that, we can use that to our advantage if we're looking for air heat products. We often do it, I shouldn't say often, we usually do it with blower doors. So that's a whole bank of blower doors installed that control pressure. So we intend to know what pressure difference we have in the building. And you can kind of get a bunch of different images out of it. Uh, air leakage images are like this, where they're usually fairly uh, there's sort of like a flare, it's not a regular shape room because it's, it's air, often flowing out, so they're kind of uh, a bit wispy. Uh, this is conductive loss, which is 
normal and so, so to be expected. So this is thermal, <coughs> thermal region for shelving. And that's, you know, I guess we can do uh, big efforts to cut down on it, but to some extent, until the advanced sky books, we're going to have things like that happen. Um, and then presence of moisture is also something that's just detected by it, because uh, if there's masonry, for example, that has absorbed moisture through the day, it's not warmed up by solar effects, and you scan it that evening, the areas of the masonry that are moist are holding on to that heat longer than the areas that are dry. And so these kind of patterns, that they're not very bright, you know, it's pretty dull compared to the air age, but you can kind of see their sort of modeled appearance, that tends to be moisture. But for the purpose of this discussion, it's this kind of thing that we're looking for. So if we're doing an infrared air leakage inspection, what we need to have is we need to have the temperature differential, we say you know, five degrees, but the quality of the signature is much, much better as you get colder. Now, our technologists don't like it, because it's not very much fun being outside of the camera at minus 10, minus 20, but if the bigger you can make this differential, the better your signature is going to be. But minimum five degrees inside that. Um, you need to have the pressure difference across the surfaces you're inspecting. You need to know what that pressure difference is. And the pressure obviously has to be consistent um, with the, uh, the directional flow. So the, here's a shot. Um, uh, in infrared tomography, areas that are warmer or higher energy levels show up as brighter in sort of the red orange spectrum. And areas that are colder at lower energy levels show up in the darker, so sort of the dark blue kind of spectrum. So this one, I uh, almost guarantee you, uh, see how the floor, floor vent is showing up warm? So it's probably actually delivering heat as the image is being taken. But all of this, the dark area, is showing you very low temperature levels. So let's just have a quick look here. At, so interior inspections, if you, if you take your imaging from the interior, what you do is you do one where you know for sure using your door fans, you've got the building positively pressurized relative to that side. So if there's a hole in my envelope, my air leak is just going to be going out. And if I'm scanning on the inside, I won't see anything because the, the, the hot air is all going up. So here, under positive pressure, everything looks uniformly warm. And then we turn the pressure around. So now we're negative, so that if there is a hole in the envelope, we're going to suck cold air, at least five degrees colder, hopefully more, in through the any holes. And the same scan, and all of a sudden you start to see <coughs> those areas where oh yeah, it's clearly an air control. So just um, just a difference in between um, Celsius and Fahrenheit, that's 40 degrees for us, because you have 5 degrees Celsius. Different. Right? Different. Different. Yeah. So yeah, so that's 40 degrees mm -hmm. this side of the border. Um, Compared to your indoor temperature? No. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just converting it. So 5 degrees C, 10 to 40, 10 to 40, yeah. I, I just um, Google said it was. So, so there, so there. No, that, is that, that's probably the conversion from 5 degrees C to X degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. But, but as a differential, it, would, it must be something in the order of. Uh, okay. So I it's just, 40, so I guess just. 4 degrees that is one? Um, it's, yeah, it's, you'll just need a larger. In order to see this, um, yeah. So, because um, you're not, you're not going to be able to see those numbers, yeah. or that that degree of variance, um, uh, which is five degrees, I guess. Is what it is. Yeah, fair enough. So, if you're shooting from the outside, scanning from the outside, same kind of condition, but on the inside, when we're scanning, we're looking for dark areas. That's the area that's going to flag a concern for us. If you're shooting from the outside now, you're looking for the hot areas because now what you're looking for is where the hole exists and where the air from the inside that's all nice and warm is being blown out and it's warming, locally warming the surface, the outside surfaces of the wall. So here's the specimen. Uh, the concern was these panels. Uh, here's the uh, overall shot. It turns out it wasn't just these panels because if you look, there's a problem with all the perfect <coughs> So all these are bright spots and you can see how it's sort of flaring. That's all air leakage problems. And if you blow it up, there's a close up of this panel. And just to be sure, we turn the pressure negative, and there's the same panel, okay? Same night, same temperature difference, but now negative pressure, positive pressure, and if you look, all the flaring around the panel is gone. There is still some residual heat in the, in the masonry, which is always a problem for us, because you heat the masonry when you intentionally pressurize and you're blowing the warm air out, it heats the masonry up. Uh, when you reverse it, it sticks around for a while. 
So you can sometimes kind of get a bit of a, a bad conclusion on something like this. But the good news is that these critical problems around the panels, it's it's night and day to their time. I'm going to initiate a down to be the radio on the basement on some day. Well, you have to be a, you can't stand too soon in the evening. So you want it to be a nice warm day to get everything as warm as possible, but you have to scan at least an hour after the sun has gone down to give the chance to go. And I don't really have it here, but the shot I had with the, the moisture, if you wait at least an hour, unless it's got moisture in it on masonry, it, it'll tend to dissipate. And low thermal mass walls, like metal glass curtain wall and aluminum panels, they dissipate extremely quickly. The biggest problem is the heavier thermal mass walls like the heavy masonry wall, right? because they just hold on to it for so long. So, since you're taking some angles, what's your experience in like, the photographs of your comments in that area? Yeah, heavy. Wow, this was a rock saw, uh, mineral wall. What is, what are you seeing with that with the, the time frame? Does that make you dramatic with that? Well, if you have a very high insulated wall, yeah. then you're going to get the outside cladding probably from the faster. That's right. right. Because it's not getting any beneficial, beneficial warming through from the inside anymore. So mm -hmm. the more extension you have separating from the inside, the, the more you know, rapidly it's going to respond to the outdoor temperatures. Yeah. So uh, I think the final slide I have here, um, this was a, or not, it still is, uh, I think it's in Boston, it's a theater. And uh, like the slide I showed you with the icicles, the complaint was icicles hanging off the other side. Brand new build, brand new build. And uh, icicles hanging on the other side of the whole thing. And so we went to the site with the camera to start with, and it's pretty evident from that. Um, we took video of some of the the six fog testing, which I tried to import to run because the video, I, I like it because you can just see the fog absolutely billowing out of all here. But what's even better is the, the audio that goes with it, the architect, <laughs> and he says, so, so what am I supposed to be seeing? And the fog's just screaming out. Mm -hmm. and he says, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, it didn't work for the yet. Anyway, so that's it. Uh, if there are any more questions that you either want to ask now or later, I'm happy to chat with you later, or maybe we talk with you or any other people. Uh, you talked about your lab testing on um, E283 and on the field test in 73. Yes. What kind of percentage difference have you seen from the same mock up that you did in both between the, between the lab and the field itself? Percentage difference in performance or percentage yeah. difference of failures? Performance. Um, well, performance wise, if you think about it, uh, right the sample in the field. De depending on, on the way the specs are written, but normally the expectation is that you should achieve the same in both. Right. So it's not so, so much a question of when you see the performance drop in the field, it's a question of what it took to get to that point. So what I do see, uh, we did a uh, project, uh, a $16 million video replacement job, it was so big that they decided they couldn't single source to the manufacturer. So they ended up getting supply windows from uh, at least three, maybe four of the big names that helped the little models, but only even but probably their old capital would be better. Anyway, um, so they all went through lab testing, and they all had the report. Right? Maybe something from our, plant, uh, our lab and some other where it says we tested it and it worked. And three of those four manufacturers, these are not small by the eight manufacturers, these are supposedly premium manufacturers. Three of the four uh, shipped, started shipping their product off the production line to the site and so on, and they did the field testing. And three of the four failed. It took them several iterations to, to get it worked out. And it was little quirky things where somebody on the line hadn't remembered to put a seal on a, on a corner or, or a certain scene or something like that. So it's very common, very, very common that the first test in the field fails where the laboratory test passed. Yeah. And it's it's why I say to people that way they're trying to keep them on business, but I say to people, they're both really important, they're both really valuable, but one doesn't promise, doesn't guarantee the other. It's one you Anything else? So you, you find the testing too. We do moisture testing in the field as well. So you would come out and do uh, air infiltration and water. Yeah, those are the two that are absolutely the most common. Yeah. Um, water penetration, and I don't know how much you guys know about it, but water penetration, there's kind of uh, two uh, standard ways of doing it. Far and away, the most common is static pressure. And by static, I mean that you use a chamber. In fact, usually it's the same chamber I showed you. 
you create a static pressure in the chamber, and it's just maintained. And it's held, if it's a commercial wall or something, it's held for 15 minutes by ASTM 31, I think it is, uh, for 15 minutes, and there should be nothing monitored for the image. Uh, there is a companion standard for windows where you cycle the pressure and keep the water going. So you literally flip the switch on the board, you know, let it go down to zero for a minute, and flip it back around in five seconds or four seconds back. So that's the static testing. Um, my personal preference is the dynamic testing. And uh, you may have seen, I don't know if you can go back, but, but there were some slides with the mock-ups uh, where we show other than in, up here. So uh, can you see that one? See what that what's there? It's like, that's a turbo prop airplane engine. And it's the one that everybody gets the sexy one, is what I really like to see. Because literally what we do, and it's it's an ammo standard, is uh, downstream of the fan, so between the fan and the specimen, we hang a, a rack which has all the nozzle on just do a straight array. But you, you turn the, the propeller on and it drives the water at the wall. That's why it's called that now. Um, that for many, many years was only ever done in the Lab. In the very recent past, in the last couple of years, Adam has accepted the clean up fuel. And we now have six or seven, they're not aircraft engines, but they're about six foot diameter fans connected to a four port Cadillac turbo engine or something. And the whole thing goes up on a on the pallet with a telescoping portlet. And uh, it's got the, uh, the array of nozzles mounted downstream of the fan. And we can uh, we can test up the probably the Pascal's dynamic water penetration in the field. And it's super attractive because, first of all, it's the best simulation of the driver can create. Static is, it was developed to simulate somewhat, but, but it's not it's not the way you falls. You don't get a static, you get gusts and, and variations in the pressure. So it's the most accurate simulation. But the best thing about it is you don't need a chamber. So anywhere you can move on the outside of the building with this device, you can run a test. And all you need inside is a set of locks. So it's expensive to get it to a site, but if you're going to plan to do multiple tests, you can rattle off between a half a dozen and a dozen tests in a day with this device. And there's no disruption on the inside of the, the build or the occupants of the existing building other than someone walking on the building. Whereas if you try to do 12 areas or 6 areas with a static test, you have to build a chamber in each location, and yeah, it's a real thing. So, yes, we do. Both in the lab and in the field. Speaking of that, Oh, well, we have, we, there's three devices here in, uh, in the Chicago lab. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, I know when the schedule will exist in the message of the But you can see the test in the lab. It's the same test as the testing in the lab. This past year, uh, the, the terms that you've always heard about durability and resiliency have been a topic, but the fires that have Finding its way to you guys more frequently now? Uh, so, our company is heavily involved uh, in the Dreadful Power investigation. Uh, we're actually hosting a three day event uh, with the UK Parliament at the end of the month. And uh, not me, but the, uh, the fire guys have brought in fire experts from around the world and now we're getting together to talk about what needs to change in the standards and whatnot. Uh, I'm actually still so involved because they are. Uh, they're asking me to go and participate to see whether we can somehow start integrating uh, the kind of work we would do on the model with the kind of work the fire people would want to do. Um, and the challenge is that they're completely separate from that. Right so uh, anyone who's giving any consideration to how an model may or may not work from a fire perspective is blinders on with respect to uh, these environmental separation issues and vice versa. And it really needs to somehow start to, to mesh together so that you're looking at and I think what the, one of the problems is that uh, in the interest of thermal performance, people have been putting insulation products in walls that have higher performance, i.e. both right? And they've been doing that somewhat blind to the fire standard. So, yeah, higher, higher R values, but more and more than the wall. But nobody's ever stopped to say, well, what about the flammability? And the flammability side of it, of course, they're, you know, they're not even thinking about thermal performance. 
So if there's a bit of a not a bit to be disconnected, you have the guys are heavily involved in the the polls are being together. Also we kind of currently assume that in Europe there's a chain of custody following them. So it's not just uh, the manufacturer, it's also the distributor of the contract that reducing the materials throughout. There's a circle liability through the whole chain. That's how applied it. It's not in the US currently. Right? The manufacturers getting their product tested. Yeah. And the distributor and the contractors kind of hiding underneath their small yeah. box. But that might be some yeah. cross integration of how it goes to the fire department. I'm told that the UK economy is going to be stole because of this. And how did that be? But apparently, um, the insurance companies won't insure buildings. There's something like 2,200 other buildings. Mm -hmm. The same kind of system you apply. UK the insurers won't insure them right now until they've been vetted to be safe. And uh, banks won't the banks won't use them. So there's no sales going on. Uh, people want to get in or out of these properties because funds won't flow. Uh, and the insurance companies are saying you know we won't insure them. So they claim it's having a major effect on, on the economy because they put up real estate when you all these uh, assets are, are frozen. Uh, they all have to be studied and potentially modified and so it's a big deal. You know. I have a question on uh, E283. So I, I just Googled it and I saw that some recessed lighting was um, ASTM graded by or passed by Google. So okay. are there uh, a pass fail criteria that need to be met? No. Um, ASTM 283 and all the ASTM standards that apply to our are procedures only. So it's up to the professional to say, here's the test procedure you're going to follow by ASTM 283, and they have to prescribe it on this level. So if you're building a building and it's two stories high and your use and occupancy is going to be uh, warehouse, you might say, oh, I'm good with uh, the rate of X at a pressure differential of 50 pascals. But if you're building a high-rise commercial office tower, you'd probably say, no, no, I need to test at 300 pascals, and I need the new trade to be a fraction of X. So that decision as to what the performance criteria, it, that lies with the, the design question. All ASTM 283 tells you is, once you know what you're gunning for, this is how you go about evaluating. Um, but I know there are lots of other standards where there is a pass-fail criteria that doesn't apply in this. I think one of the water standards says that in the absence of anything, here's the minimum, but it's still clear that it's really up to the professional to, to, to make the decision what's appropriate for their job. And if you look at it, it makes perfect sense, certainly from the water, even from the air company, but if you look at it, the amount of water that will hit the face of a tower compared to the amount of water that will hit a little low rise building, uh, and the tower is in the East Coast and the, the low rise buildings in Nevada. Wholesale difference into what kind of conditions it's going to see. So it is appropriate that the standards the same for how you do it, but you tell them what kind of it's And it can be an assembly or a product, correct? Um, That's tough, isn't it? Yeah, we, we typically, if we're just doing a product like a window, uh, we, we wouldn't use the, the 283 because the 283 is sort of more for our uh, overall wall assembly. Uh, we're taxing them right now. 547 maybe is for a window, but there are standards for just window elements, for example. But if you're doing an overall wall assembly, then you use 283. I really love the, the unitized curtain wall system. And of course, in the task house, there's glazing portions to, to assume the heat from the sun. And you have lots of wall assembly questions to drive the wall assembly. And with the whole world of Closed cell, open cell foam, rigid foams, all those EPS foams. Do you have uh, case studies that that alert you, like personally, when you see those versus the people that build the assemblies with the mineral world type systems, foam free? Case studies from a the thermal perspective or? Uh, <coughs> Thermal, but also I think for me mostly on the fire side. Because the wall assemblies thermally, we can do this very well with the modeling systems that exist, but uh, the fire thing, because you are uniquely qualified in that yeah. direction, I can kind of 
Yeah, um, I'll be honest with you. My background and our entire firm, the U.S. Fed background, is all on the building up from a, from a separation point of view. So we focused on air, water, structural characteristics. They're the three things that we deal mostly with. Um, condensation, but we, we don't do fireside. Oh, and the UL absolutely does the fireside, but we don't. So as I say, in the British situation, we are building that to North America, where we have firms like ours that are focusing entirely on separation characteristics, and other firms that are focusing entirely on fire attributes, but not really to look at the whole picture. So UL, now that we are part of the development, that's certainly part of their plan is to actually now get the photo and all this so listen, we can do the whole thing. But the expertise on the fire side won't be from me or from my group, it will be from somebody on the existing UL side who already has that, that background. Yeah. So I personally I can't help you with it, but I can certainly put me in touch with people if you have some sort of questions you can answer the questions on the fire. Group. And I do it all the time. And now someone asks me something on fire, I say, I don't know, but what's the question on my side does? Okay. <clears throat> all right. You have to do two tests. You do compartmentalization testing, which is singular unit, and um, you also do the whole building test. So, um, so for instance, in the in the projects that we're working with Pearl, they will be doing um, compartmentalization testing as one component, and um, it's just a single fan, and it tests the connectivity in between the units. So you want to make sure that the boundaries in between um, and the connectivity in between those adjacent units are as minimal as possible. And there's a threshold that you need to adhere to, which is 0 0.30 CFM per 100 square feet on the yield curve. Um, the next one that you have to do um, that we were talking about is the whole building testing. And what's required for passive house is pressurized and depressurized tests. Um, they, uh, you do the two tests and then you add it up and um, you get the average for it. Um, it's, it's a pretty big production, not going to lie. Um, there's a lot in, that in the next couple slides we'll show you all the equipment that's involved. But um, we, we use one of these two, three, one, two, or three 
um, uh, paneled uh, shrouds, um, and, and we, we take down to 50, and um, sometimes we can get it done in one, and sometimes two, it, it depends on um, the protocol. For, uh, uh, it depends on the protocol that we're testing to. So we had a multifamily uh, passive house project in Madison that we only needed one fan for. Um, we did some IECC testing up in the course that we needed two fans for. So, um, so it really just depends on what aspect. Um, there's also another type of test called the guarded test that some of the standards um, allow and some standards don't. So ResNet will allow guarded testing, however, Kind of a gray, gray area right now with IDA um, and IECC does not allow guarded testing. So what guarded testing is is um, a combination of both the whole building testing and the compartmentalization specific unit testing at the same time. So um, the whole building testing is testing the entire envelope. So that is not worried about the cross connection in between two units. When you do the guarded test, you're taking the entire, everything inside the thermal envelope and you're putting it all, um, we typically do it at, um, we typically depressurize, and the reason why we choose that is um, when you pressurize it, you're more apt to blow open dampers and, and other things that may have been, been closed and sealed. So we usually depressurize and then the the guarded test, the singular unit, now we're not worried about this type of leakage. We're only worried, or we're only getting the leakage that's coming out of this area. So it's a helpful diagnostic tool um, to, get, to get exactly what you're looking for for a specific unit. We do the single guard in specific unit? Um, do, do we, uh, for, for passive house or for? Right, for this testing. Uh, as opposed to the whole, the building, the whole building. So you test should, each unit for its. So usually, if we're doing the testing, if we're doing it on a whole building, we would have some sort of sampling plan in place. Um, Ida does not uh, follow the same ResNet sampling plan. They have their own system for um, how many units and what types of units they want tested, and then IECC um, does not allow. Sampling. So, um, just I would say be, be aware when you have to adhere and conform to the different standards, um, which one you're specifically going for, because that will determine when the test will be happen. Um, so, the, the preparation of it, um, and if you can't read this, this is kind of a funny little. Uh, cartoon. I think my spell checker is broken. It keeps changing luck to preparation. Um, and, and that's a big part of it, is making sure that you're fully prepared for the test that you have to do. Um, it's a big procedure, especially on some of these very large buildings, making sure that you've got the right amount of fan, um, uh, Lordor fans, um, tubing, wireless, uh, you never know when your wireless might kick in or kick out, so you have to have a backup for that. Um, uh, connecting with the different trades people, having the building set up in the proper um, uh, way to make sure that you're getting the right leakage, you're showing the right amount of leakage. Um, and this is this is a little sense of it. So um, multiple blower doors. Uh, if you're doing the compartmentalization testing, we, all, we often do that in conjunction with a duct blaster test because we don't need the, um, the capacity that a, you know a huge fan can do, but hundreds and hundreds of feet of tubing, multiple tubing, um, having a cart to go with it, and um, routers. Um, it's been, to be honest with you, it's been really interesting to, to put everything together. Um, and been cool as a team to develop the, the practice and, and um, see how the different buildings are performing. Okay. 
So um, for the testing, everything that um, uh, the condition of the building, if it's if you have a continuously running intake or exhaust, you can seal that off. If you don't, it's left open. Um, so the dampers are left to perform on their own. If you don't have dampers in certain intermittent systems, you can't seal them off. So, um, so that's why the coordination with the different um, contractors is imperative because uh, the building team doesn't always know what, um, how the mechanicals are running and to be able to, to um, seal off everything that's needed so that you have the right um, final test is needed. So, and yeah, this was just a project where they, they sealed off the intakes on the exterior and they ended up having to get a crane um, in order to have that happen. This was not one of our own projects, but um, one of our colleagues. Um, so, uh, basically where, where we're at, so ICC, we're now in 2015, um, so that's the, the Florida figures that are being required, and we are at 5 ACH per, even though we're in climate zone um, 5, it should be at 3 ACH. Our passive house numbers are 0.05 um, for CF, or 0 0.05 CFM per 100 square feet of enclosure, so it's not the direct volume metric. Um, uh, ACH uh, configuration, um, but it's more of the surface area is what we're is what we're testing. And so, but these tests are a core component of all these different certifications as you move along the line. So yeah, so. Um, just to, to recap, for the passive house specifically, your single family homes are going to have to meet the 0 0.05 ratio, and then the um, multi-family projects are going to have for the whole building is the 0 0.05, and then the units are 0.30. Um, I just have a question again about the guarded uh, test. Is that a situation where Yeah, so um, so it depends the extent of the rehab, whether or not that testing is needed. Um, if you're changing, if it's an existing building, you're changing the, energy, the amount of energy that's been used um, or that the building is using, then you will, according to the state energy code, you are supposed to have that building tested. And yes, that would be, that guarded test is helpful for you, especially if you're hired into a situation where you haven't really had um, the ability to, to air seal as much, um, it helps minimize the leakage that, that is happening um, that, that can be needed for that particular unit. And then like, in, in, inside the building itself, right? So if you, you alter the envelope in some capacity, then you can kind of negate the leakage of the unit. Is that is that what you're doing? Sorry, I'm just trying to understand this. Um, so, so the garden test. Um, or the opposite, sorry. Yeah, so the garden okay. test basically, so it's only going to test that unit and it's going to negate any other, any, so even if you didn't well seal the, the demising wall um, and some of the penetrations through the demising wall or if you have any leakage that is happening through like your social anywhere, um, it, it negates all of that because the entire down to the, the threshold, the Pascal threshold that it needs to. So then once that that individual one kicks on, then you know that that's just the leakage that's happening out that exterior wall, not what's happening on the inside. And, and I, you're saying Ida doesn't like this isn't a little bit Ida's a little bit Ida's a little bit gray on that right now. I think actually In 
can someone help me with the historic buildings and they can get an exemption for that? So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I, I just. And I would say in that case, just get very clear direction from them on what's expected and what we can do. Yeah, I think that they. And that's what's been that's what's been helpful for the IECC testing is that they'll allow the whole building testing versus um, uh, in addition to the unit by unit test. So even in some of the new, like one of our new construction projects, by the by the nature of the assemblies that they decided on, they were it was just inherent that they were going to fail compartmentalization testing. So unit by unit. So we suggested that instead of complying via compartmentalization, that we would do the whole building. And they actually came in at like 1.5 ACH. Because the volume is so the volume is so huge that the amount of leakage has less of an impact. Um, but just wrap up, make sure everybody can see you later and for great questions. And thank you to these two um, presenters for a great.